right, so Scarlett and I are out of the hospital. Everything went off without a hitch. She's completely fine. Right now she's in the hotel room taking a nap. And that means that I should probably take some time to address some of the things in the comic book world that I happened to miss while all of this was happening. Or like while I was getting prepared for a wedding and a comic con and this. Oh, but Panda, you kind of just slacked off for two weeks. What could you possibly have... How am I like TikTok's resident DC guy and somehow I end up missing basically every single time big news drops? So starting with this, I'm going to maintain my cautiously optimistic take. I have been and am still excited for Superman Legacy and I'm even excited for the fact that they're using the logo from my favorite comic of all time, Kingdom Come. However, I would be lying if I wasn't a little bit worried as to why they're using this logo. Superman only really wears this logo when like shit's gone down. And like, hey, maybe it's just like a new direction for the character, like when they really changed up Batman's logo for the Batman. I don't know, man, it just, uh, it's, it's like when they cast Guy Gardner and I was like, this is setting off alarm bells, but I can't really tell why. This is setting off alarm bells and I can't really tell why. I did see that James Gunn posted like a whole mood board of all of his inspirations for this version of Superman. And honestly, I agree with pretty much all of them. Am I a little concerned that like two or three of the stories in that mood board were about the death of Superman in his first movie? Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit. Like, th th listen, All-Star Superman is one of the best Superman stories of all time. However, multiple cast members have said that they're using that as inspiration for the story. And do I need to remind everybody that All-Star Superman is about Superman's death? Like, unambiguously, it's celebrating the history of Superman before he fucking dies. And Kingdom Come is Superman being faced with a world that no longer holds his ideals and if he can really be a hero in that world. I don't know, alarm bells, alarm bells, but cautious optimism, I'm, oh God, please be good. You know, I was planning on covering both the Batman Beyond thing and this in the same video, but I'm kind of in a, in a like video lull right now. So I think I'm gonna save that for the next one. So come back next time if you wanna hear me talk about the Batman Beyond movie that was never made, that was gonna be made by the people who made Spider-Verse. Who the fuck, who the fuck said no to this? All right, let's talk about it. They should have made it. They should have fucking made it. Listen, I had a video that got popular a little while back where I expressed the fact that I don't personally like Batman Beyond almost at all. There is nothing that I get out of Batman Beyond that I couldn't get out of Spider-Man 2099. Literally nothing. Terry is a fucking Mary Sue that got thrown in there when there are a billion characters that could have taken his place. I don't like Batman Beyond and I will stand on that. But God fucking Damn. The creators of the most revolutionary animated movie of the modern fucking age come to you with images like this, which they probably weren't like this when they pitched the movie, but they, 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 they showed their stuff in the last giant movie they made. They come to you and they say, hey, you know that franchise that is a fan favorite that is basically universally loved outside of that one weird mohawk guy on TikTok who won't shut the fuck up about hating it? Yeah, you know how we also made the most revolutionary animated movie of the 20th century? Yeah, awesome. Um, we we want to do that for you. We, we want to do that for you. We want to. We actually, we desire to make that for you. You don't even have to come to us. In fact, we have the pitch for you. We want to make this movie and everyone's going to want to see it. Can you imagine seeing this? Seeing this? Hearing that pitch, knowing the last movie that these guys did made more money than God, and still going, you know, I really think Black, I really think Black Adam's gonna sell, man. I, I, I think we're good. I, these people brought in a pitch that is essentially a printing press for money, and went, we would love to give this to you. Just give us a budget and we'll give this to you. And you went, mm, mm, nah. I would shell out to see that because I know the visuals for that would be astounding. I could give a shit about the story and I would still go and see that. And I know that the creators of that would still make an amazing story. Why did they say no? You know what, no, I want an actual like written answer from the producers that says, here is all the reasons why we couldn't and wouldn't do this movie that everyone would have loved, that everyone would have seen. Why? Look at that. Look at that and tell me that's not the coolest shit in the world. I would have shelled out to see that in a fucking instant.
oh my god how would you say no so i actually saw a couple comments talking about the beanie that i was wearing in that video ironically i'm not actually wearing that beanie right now but yeah let's talk about the goon because that beanie wasn't an original piece of merch for me that that is a piece of merch for a completely different independent work namely my personal favorite independent book the goon how would i describe this to someone who hasn't already read it do you like hellboy do you like the vibe of hellboy now imagine that was a mob book and also add in just a touch more humor that's kind of what the goon is like why is it called the goon well that's this guy right here he's the goon he's the head enforcer for a mobster named labrazio anybody wants to talk to labrazio they go through him and the labrazio crime family essentially runs the entire city in which the book takes place which is filled with your usual 1920s crime stuff but also a whole bunch of supernatural threats like zombies and witches and all of that sort of shit it's not like the usual mob where you're paying protection for nothing this guy actually is giving protection to like businesses and people who pay him because there are fucking zombies in the streets. Here's the central hook of the book, though. And spoiler alert here, if you haven't read it and you want to, honestly, go and read The Goon, it's awesome. You see, Labrazio... Labrazio's fucking dead. The Goon here killed him when he was nothing but a boy. After Labrazio, through an act of pure fucking stupidity, had his aunt killed. You see, after his aunt got killed, he thought that Labrazio owed him something. So not only did he kill him, he also took over his entire operation. But no one's gonna follow a lowly goon. So he just says that he works for Labrazio and runs it all himself. Honestly, The Goon is an Eisner Award winning book you should honestly go and check out any goon store you can get a hold of. I fucking love this book, and I love the fact that I can show off another independent piece. Go check out The Goon. It's published under Dark Horse Comics. It's awesome. So I have these two Red Hood theories that piggyback off of each other. See, it's a pretty common thing for artists to draw Jason with these autopsy scars on his chest after he had died. It's a pretty easy shorthand to say he's died before. But here's the thing. Jason Todd was canonically dropped in the Lazarus Pit after he had died. Lazarus Pit doesn't just bring you back to life. It also heals all injuries, which means those scars shouldn't really be there. But here's how I justify Red Hood having the autopsy scars, because I personally like the fact that they're there. You see, I think that the Lazarus Pit kind of factory reset his body. Usually Lazarus Pits aren't meant to bring people back from the dead. They're essentially fountains of youth. So you dropped a corpse in there. It's going to try and heal it as good as possible. Which makes me think every injury that Jason had before he died gets healed. Bruised knuckles, scars from being homeless, calloused hands, all of those gone instantly. But wounds that had been caused post-mortem are just closed. Because here's the second theory, Jason was only in the Lazarus pit for like a couple of seconds. He gets dropped in, wakes up, gets out, and goes on a rampage. He doesn't bathe in it like Roz does. So while the pit was able to bring him back to life and heal all of those pre-death injuries, the post-mortem injuries, aka the autopsy scars that cut all the way through him, those just close and scar over. That's kind of how I justify Jason being able to be covered in scars from his days of being Red Hood without having all of the scars that he had as Jason Todd. Every scar he gets after becoming the Red Hood is in this new body. It also makes it, I think, a little bit more tragic because that makes it that Jason Todd was in one second being beat to death in a warehouse, covered in blood, covered in scars, and then the next second waking up in a cave somewhere in a body with fresh skin and none of the scars that makes your body yours, except for these three giant ones on your chest that you don't recognize. It would also make a certain neck scar that he gets later in his career even more tragic because at that point, the rest of his body isn't covered in scars. It's just the big one on his chest and the big one on his neck. I don't know, that's my personal take. It's how I justify Jason having the autopsy scars even though he shouldn't because of the pit. Let me know if it makes sense for y'all. I wanna know if this is just me rambling. I'm just... I'm just gonna need stuff to like stop happening for like just a little, just a little bit. I know I've said this before, but like, good fucking God, can stuff just stop happening for just a tiny bit? Scarlet and I have been running around this entire week with our one car because she has a shit ton of job interviews and I make my own hours and work from home. So, you know, I'd rather be there in the car with her supporting her than just waiting at home for her to get back. But damn, that girl is qualified. We've had like five this week. Two of them were two hours away at like eight o'clock in the morning, twice. We have a con this entire weekend that we had no cosplays for that we're working on this weekend. By the way, I'm gonna be at Sakura Con in Seattle, Washington this weekend. Come say hi. We're dog sitting for a friend all of next week. Jesus, fuck. I just need stuff to stop happening for a little while. Like I got projects to do. Anyway, for my own mental health so that I can take a fucking breather, 
We're gonna do one of the easy ones today. Welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly, not weekly show where I take one character out random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run him the fuck down. I fixed the lights. Everything was too damn bright. Who are we getting today? Give me someone fun. Give me someone we haven't done before. Please give me someone we haven't done before. This is the whole reason I made this goddamn wi- Prez? Prez? I will bet this month's rent that this is a president-themed superhero. Ha <laughs> would you look at that? That's insane. Ah, uh, my PayPal's in my bio, y'all know what- There is just- there- there is so much going on here. So first of all, apparently this dude's slogan is Cool it, man, you had your chance. Which is just a fucking wild thing to have as your tagline for president. He's rolling with the edgy version of the Planeteers. Also apparently a pet monkey, like he's Michael Jackson, and that's just- it, In a convertible, my man? You aren't afraid of that thing jumping out? Absolutely nobody on the sides is- is voting for this man. Also, he's 18, which- I mean, give me a quick go- Yeah, that's- that's quite literally unconstitutional. Also, why does he look so smug about it? I- I don't like that face he's making. What- what the fuck do you know that I don't, fucko? Why is he smiling in every other picture of him other than when he's in the fucking car? I don't trust him. He looks like a crook. Wow, did- Wow, okay, this is gonna be a longer video. I'm so sorry. There is just- Fuck me, there is just so much to get through. Prez was created by Joe Simon. Yes, that Joe Simon. And Jerry Grand... Grandin... Grandin... Jerry Grandinetti. In Prez number one of DC Comics. Yes, THE DC Comics. In September of 1973. So let's get a couple of things out of the way. Off the jump. First teen president of the USA. Absolute lie. He is 21 years old. Thing number two. My man is backed by the mob. No, I am not kidding. 21-year-old Prez Rickard is a, a kid who lives in a place called Steadfast. Now, here's the thing. Steadfast has a metric fuck ton of clocks. I promise this ties back into the story. Here's the problem. Every clock in Steadfast runs differently and on the wrong time. Well, it sure is a good thing that Mr. Prez Rickard is a great clocksmith. And he goes through and one by one fixes every one of the literal thousands of clocks in Steadfast. What a nice guy, you might say. And I would agree. In fact, you know who would also agree? Boss Smiley. A rather rotund mob boss whose face looks like a smiley face button. How is this real? Seeing how much people like this Prez as Rickard fella, he sponsors him as the youngest senator in U.S. history. Which, might I remind you again, is a 21-year-old kid. Which is also fucking illegal! Don't worry about that, though. They pushed through a couple of very quick constitutional amendments so that he can run for president. Which, being backed by the fucking mob, he wins! Oh, but don't you worry, though. Prez's Native American friend, Eagle Free, who also just so happens to be the director of the FBI, helps Prez loose the shackles of his mob boss boss, which frees him up to do normal president stuff. Like defeat robots, and werewolves, and vampires. How is this fucking book real? Apparently Prez was supposed to be, like, super metaphorical and allegorical for the, uh, more free and loving version of politics that baby boomers introduced in the 70s when compared to their more business-minded counterparts that came before them. My, how the times are a-changing, huh? In fact, this book was so subtle that when Neil Gaiman added these characters into the Sandman universe, he made Prez a literal stand-in for Christ, resisting the temptation of the satanic boss Smiley. Honestly, I want to say regrettable right off the bat, but, like, I think that if this was brought back as, like, a modern-day kind of satirical political commentary sort of comic, I think it could really work. However, we saw how the worst of us reacted to Snowflake and Safe Space. Yeah, fuckers, that's right. This is the part of the video where you realize that I'm actually a Snowflake and Safe Space defender. Yeah, I absolutely am. We didn't read the fucking book. You don't know how they were going to use those characters. I'm not saying it would have been good, but we didn't need to bully Marvel into getting rid of them. I'm sorry. I've had this conversation far too many times. I think that this would be really cool. Uh, as a modern day kind of political satire if um, our world wasn't our world. But because it is, and this is fucking ridiculous in a weird way and not particularly a fun way, it gets the seal of regret. I'm sorry, you're fun, but fuck you're weird. That is going to be it for this month. I just want to say thank you to all of my lovely, lovely patient patrons over on Patreon. 
Amanda Barnstead, Andrell Lanowitz, Anthea Yu, Bill Bro, Brandon Bilbrey, Carol Cowett, Christopher Boscar, definitely not five Gene Steelers in a trench coat, Dragon Fang, Eddie XIII, Elizabeth Rush, Gamer X, Gamma Pool, Have a Heart Tin Man, In Japan, Ivana Marin, Jack Colson, Jacob Safel, Jake Williamson, Jeffrey of Isles, Jeremy Strickland, Cat Q, Katie Did It, Kyle Rayner, Imni, Magu, Max Baker, Midnight Ace Evergreen, Mr. Nobody 13, Nixie Shimo, Noah, Oplin, Pinchy Mugre, Ricky Tiki Dave, Samuel Peak, Schmop Clop, Shadow Spike, Shen Dude, Simply Smithy Jr., Slither and Deception, Sorino, Tangled Web, The Brain Teaser, The Holy Corota, Thomas Randolph, Toon Reaper, Toy Box, TS Fyamder, Tyler Ellis, and all of my other lovely, lovely patrons over on Patreon. And if you too want your name read out in the credits of every one of the videos that I do over here on YouTube, then head on over to Patreon and subscribe for $15 or more. Or, if you just want to be generous, even a dollar help. So if you were here last month, you heard me talk about it already, but March was a hectic ass month for me. It started with just so much traveling and then recovery from Scarlet's surgery as soon as we got home. March was a rough one, guys. I'm hoping April is going to be a little bit lighter. I don't have much to say in this little ending piece here, but I just wanted to thank all of you for being so patient, for enjoying my content, for watching me, for subscribing, for even just following along. I absolutely love every single one of you, and I'm so glad that I get to do this for a living and give all of you guys all this content. So thank you guys for sticking around, and I will see y'all in the next one.